please join me in giving a big South by Southwest welcome to Guy Kawasaki and Senator Mazi Hirano. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, aloha. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everybody. First of all, oh my God, it's Maisie. Yes. Yeah, remember, crazy for Maisie, okay? Um, and please use this hashtag, because I thought this hashtag was so clever, but nobody's getting it. So it's Maisie and Guy again, uh uh, a la M A G A. Okay. Oh my God. My, my best material falls flat. Yeah. Well, it, it's, you know what, Guy? I just thought it was really cute that um, my first name was not pronounced correctly. And some of you may know that the president recently has referred to me twice on national TV as that crazy female senator from Hawaii. And I was asked by some press people, why does he refer to you as that? And I said, because he probably can't pronounce my name. And he doesn't want to be seen as an idiot in front of his adoring crowds. So you see, there. It's <laughs> it is not some weird Asian name. It's actually an old English name. It's great to see all of you here. I think we have some fierce competition. There's a science guy who's talking or something. And I'm just really happy to see so many of you who are here. Mahalo nui loa. Thank you. Thank you. We are both from Hawaii, by the way. So um, if, if we drop into pigeon, <laughs> we'll, we'll yeah. translate for you, OK? Um, I know it's kind of sad to say, but I never learned to speak pigeon. Uh, I can understand pigeon, but I'm not born in this country. I'm an immigrant, and so I had to learn English. And, the, <laughs> and my friends were all Caucasians. Oh, yeah? So other people thought I was so re weird. They didn't want to hang out with me. Did you and Barack hang out? Are you kidding? He went, <laughs> he went to Punahou. Yeah, it, it, I am a public school product all the way. <laughs> I went to Iolani. So. Well, there you go. I forgive you. It's because Barack couldn't get into Iolani. Um, so <laughs> can we start? Yes. So basically, first question. Has our country gone as crazy as it seems? These are not normal times. How many of you think these are normal times? See, nobody raises. I see one hand. Oh, my goodness. Are you taping this for Fox News or something? <laughs> OK, don't worry. But these are not normal times. And, and I don't think that uh, what Trump tapped into uh, during his campaign, where he really revealed some fault lines, deep fault lines in our country, such as uh, uh, you know, racism and homophobia, anti-immigrant, all of that I think was there, but he really tapped into that sense of the other and he's made it okay to be uh, very uh, anti-women, uh, anti-racist, an I mean right, racist and all of that. So I think that strain was in our country, but it was much more under control and I believe that when people act on these uh, these resentments and feelings that they have, it adds to the sense of divisiveness in our country, and I think that is not a good thing. Okay. Have we made any progress since Anita Hill? Any of you watched the Kavanaugh hearings? Can you say that we've made progress since Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas? And sad to say, as I sat there as a member of the Judiciary Committee, and knowing that this is happening, it really made me think that we have not come far enough. However, I do think that the Me Too movement uh, is uh, playing a very important part and continuing to focus on the issue of sexual harassment and sexual assault in our country, which I have characterized as the kind of behavior that we women, basically, have had to put up since time immemorial. And I, I think that as we see the kind of, this kind of behavior, if anybody engaged in this kind of behavior in the past, they can expect that some, if they're, especially if they're going to put themselves out in any position of power, that someone might co come forward. Sadly, in Dr. Ford's case, we had a situation where uh, I, you know, I for one believe that she, there was credible corroborative evidence as to what happened, and uh, I believed her. I think it was very important for me to say that I believe you, Dr. Ford. And so we had this entire uh, hearing. And, and also, a, uh, the, the FBI did an additional investigation, but that was a total sham, because the White House very much limited who they were going to talk to. 
and they certainly didn't talk to uh, an, another person who had come forward when, when uh, Judge Kavanaugh was an adult where he forced himself upon a woman. So just take us behind the scenes here. So when the cameras are off, well, when the cameras are on, senators appear to just be going at each other, right? So now when the cameras are off, are you guys back there smoking cigarettes, drinking Cokes together, and you know, <laughs> or are you still like at each other's throats? I don't think we're at each other's throats, but uh, uh, the, the comedy uh, of uh, what uh, used to be is uh, very much frayed. And I think that uh, one of the things that I really wanted to, uh, to point out, and I mentioned this to you, Guy, is that uh, you know, the things that we care about, like health care, you know, people with, uh, with pre-existing conditions in our country, which is a lot of people, one out of four people. So there's a lot of people in the audience who have pre-existing conditions. And there was a very important lawsuit filed in, the te in Texas where the Texas judge said the entire Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional. That is going to go to the Supreme Court where the court will decide uh, whether or not people with pre-existing conditions will be able to access the kind of medical care they need. So that's just one. Any of us who cares about women's choice uh, that also is going to go before the Supreme Court. Let me give you an example how Kavanaugh responded to our questions. He thought that all he had to say was, I will, I will uphold precedent. It only took him four months to go against a precedent by the Supreme Court that was only about three years ago, yet another Texas case called Whole, Whole Women's Health. And he wrote the only dissent uh, this was a Louisiana case that would have pretty much ended up with the state of Louisiana having only one abortion provider for 4.7 million people. And this abortion provider said, I'm not going to do it because there's going to be a big target on my back. That case is going to go uh, come back to the Supreme Court where Kavanaugh will be there to, they, they don't even have to undo Roe v. Wade. They don't have to, you know, uh, overturn Roe v. Wade. They will constrain the, the right of a woman to, uh, to choice so much that Roe v. Wade will be a nullity. So all of these kind of cases, voting rights cases, civil rights cases, LGBTQ cases, are all going before our federal courts. And the courts are being packed with very ideologically um, uh, motivated judges. Um, most of whom are members of the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation. And, and they come to the courts with a very strong ideologically perspect ideological perspective, which I believe will uh, not enable them to be fair and uh, objective as judges with lifetime appointments. So I talk about court packing a lot. This may not uh, have been something that was of particular hitting your radar screen, but. Uh, suffice to say, why do we need to even uh, worry about who gets elected if the judges sitting in lifetime appointments can undo and, and interpret the laws that we pass so narrowly that it will not effectuate the purposes of the law? That, but that is what's happening every single day. And one-tenth of the judiciary, which consists of about 850 judges, are now all Trump appointees, including, of course, two on the Supreme Court. 10% of the entire federal judiciary, which consists of about 850 judges at the district and circuit levels, are all Trump nominees and more to come. And of course, two on the Supreme Court is major. Supreme Court has turned so far to the right that Justice Roberts is now the swing vote, <laughs> truly. Yeah. This is, it's very concerning. So if we fast forward a few years or a decade or so, is like, woman's choice going to be an oxymoron at that It could be. And in fact, one of the first things, uh, the first political letter I ever wrote was when the state of Hawaii, which was the first state to legalize abortion, uh, we were dealing with abortion in the state level, and I wrote my very first letter to our congressional de delegation asking them what their position was on abortion. And back in the day, and I was relatively young, early 20s or so, and one of them wrote back, and uh, he gave me something that, some kind of answer that was a non-answer, and, and I sent his letter response back to him saying, I'm returning this because I don't like to receive junk mail. <laughs> I would say that I've, um, well, what can I say? But, you know, the, the, that was a huge battle then, and it's come back in spades with all of these judges on the federal court who are poised 
to restrict a woman's right to choose every chance they get. And hundreds of state laws have been passed, especially one of the states that passes the most laws that restrict a woman's right to choose is right here in the state of Texas. Um, would you say that this attitude, my interpretation from the outside looking in is that they are pro-birth, i.e. all babies should be born, but not pro-life, because once the baby is born, they seem to abandon the baby and not care about health and education and all that good stuff. So That's right. It's all about the birth, not yes. the life, right? It's forcing women to have children. How intrusive is that? So as we were thinking, what is, a, what is a really painful, unconstitutional something that we can impose on men that they don't want to have to do? <laughs> Castration. <laughs> Well, you said it. <laughs> okay. So the, the, there's, no, there's nothing like the intrusive, what I would say, the hand of government in our wombs than forcing women to have babies. That should be a choice between us and our doctors. But this is one of the huge, huge battles that we're going to have uh, continuing in the Senate. Okay. Are, are, are we saying that you know, this grand experiment called America and democracy is over and no. it failed? <laughs> Hope springs eternal, you know? Okay. We have, to, we have to keep going because of the alternative is to throw in the towel, and who wants to do that? I think with this president in particular, and I, I'm probably the first senator to say on national TV that uh, he, is a, he is a liar. He lies every single day. He's a misogynist. He's an admitted sexual predator. And he will uh, attack anybody who doesn't agree with him. And that was uh, over, I don't know when it was uh, that I said that, but th these are dangerous times. These are not normal times. And the president really stretches the, the bounds of uh, probably uh, uh, the rule of law with regard to his own powers. So we cannot abandon the institution of democracy, which actually provides us with some uh, opportunity for, for uh, you know, social justice, economic justice, and the things that we care about. Are, are the branches separate and equal <laughs> still? I mean, or is, you know, I read that <laughs> in my textbook, but is it true today? I think that the judiciary, even if 10% are all Trump nominees with their very strong ideological perspectives that will be reflected in their decision making, the, the judiciary still, I believe, views itself as an independent uh, entity. And so you have a judge in San Diego who said to this administration, you will find all the parents of the children that you uh, separated from them, creating instant orphans. Or uh, we have a judge who said that Trump's uh, ending of DACA, deferred action for childhood arrivals, that you can't do that. So there's a uh, uh, you know stay on that. So thank goodness that the judiciary still, to an extent, but the Supreme Court is changing very much to the right. And then you have, of course, the House of Representatives now with at least five committees pursuing the kind of investigations that leads to the, the kind of checks and balances that we should have. The Senate is another story, though, <laughs> because we're the ones who confirm all of the nominees. And when, uh, when Mitch McConnell won, he said, uh, Mary Garland will never get on the Supreme Court. And he single-handedly single -handedly made that, effected that. That is an abuse of power. Who ever heard of, of keeping a Supreme Court vacant for a year? Um, and he said his proudest uh, accomplishment is basically court packing and the two judges, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, that he got on the court. So Mitch McConnell can bring anything to the floor of the Senate for a vote. But what, he could have brought the bill that was passed by the House to keep government running, but he didn't do that. So for 35 days, which was the longest shutdown in the history of our country, affecting 800,000 uh, of our federal workers who got no salary, he did that. He single-handedly could have brought that House pass bill to the floor, but he kept saying, I'm going to wait. We have to wait for the president to tell us what to do. Now, this is a president who changes his mind on a whim <laughs> and uh, whose word is not good. So you know, the Congress has to act like a separate branch of government that it is so that we might I think that creates a better opportunity for bipartisan work if we didn't wait around for 
this president to figure out what but it is he wants. Educate my ignorant mind. How can Mitch McConnell just decide not to bring a bill to vote that has been voted by the House? He does it, and uh, there are not, uh, very few Republican senators who will uh, fight him on it. So the one change might be that the House passed a termination resolution to to say to the president, we are not going to support your your recent uh, you know, the, the um, national emergency, national emergency, which is not an emergency. That bill has to come to the floor. If it didn't have to come to the floor, which wouldn't bring it to the floor, but it has to come to the floor, and the Senate will probably also pass it, and the president will veto it. He's already said so. Um, I, I don't know that we have the votes to override the veto, but that is the kind of independent uh -huh. course that the House and Senate should have. So do you, do you think the forefathers should have foreseen a time where a party or a person controls multiple branches of the government and figured out that, wow, one day, what if the same party has all three branches, not so check and balance anymore? Well, that's, uh, this is the result of voters. It's us. Yeah. You know, it's not, not as though, it's not as though, <laughs> not me. <laughs> it's not as though Trump created the environment where someone like him could get elected. As I said, his, uh, his election, his campaign was one which really revealed major fault lines in our country and he exploited those fault lines. And so we need to figure out a way to uh, 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 heal those divisions. And so my fear is even if he leaves, uh, there's still gonna be all of the, these feelings and very strongly held uh, feelings that, that people have. Um, and I think it's gonna be dangerous. It's gonna be incumbent upon a lot of us to do something uh, to so, mend well, those divisions. You just. I just want to cry. Um, what? Um, well, my head explodes on a fairly regular um, basis. <laughs> you know, when, when you are s sworn in, is it the right word, sworn in no. as a senator? Yes. Yeah. You take an oath, right? Mm -hmm. Who is the oath to? Is it to the country, to the Constitution, to your party, to your president? To no, it's, it's obviously to the, the country and the Constitution. Well, what am I, did, did, you know, Paul Ryan and McConnell take the same oath that oh, you yes. did? Or, yeah? Mm -hmm. There's a mismatch. But just as you say that, that uh, they love to force women to have babies, but then they don't really care very much once the babies are born uh, in terms of they would like to eliminate all the safety nets. They want to cut the programs, health care programs for children. You know, all of that they'd like to cut. So you're right. I mean, what, what's up with all that? Right? Not to mention, you know, they, they obviously don't view the migrants who come across the border as human beings. And sure, they can sit there and say, we did not have a child separation policy. Well, they did have a policy called the zero tolerance policy, which in order to effectuate required the children to be ripped from their parents. And they obviously thought they were never going to be challenged on this. Uh, so they didn't keep the appropriate records and all that. It is just atrocious that we would make instant orphans, that that would be the policy of our country. That's why, thankfully, there was a hue and cry. But still, we have an administration okay. where they still deny that this was the effect of their zero tolerance policy. Now, I have watched more public hearings in the last two years than in my entire life, uh -huh. okay? <laughs> and, you know, it seems like those public hearings, it's just grandstanding and totally worthless. I don't think- Is that true? No, look at the Michael Cohen hearing. I don't okay. think that was uh, True. useless. I think a lot of the hearings that will be conducted that uh, investigates uh, what I would call the Trump organization, because he had an organization, mm -hmm. his foundation, his, you know, all the, uh, uh, com the, the uh, corporations he set up for all his real estate dealings, the, the, it's an organization. And he acts like the government is his, his private uh, 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 family business or something. Okay. So there are going to be all kinds of investigations. Those are not going to be a sham. And in a private hearing, is a private hearing more efficient, more effective, or because I mean, there's nobody to grandstand to, or is it the same crap? Well, not necessarily, because if you watch the, the hearings going on, a lot of the questions that I ask in the House uh, are very uh, telling questions. They're not grandstanding. They really I want to know okay. the facts. And I sat on the Intel Committee myself. And so uh, I would ask the same kind of hearings, regardless of whether it's a public hearing or, or a, uh, a closed-door hearing. Okay. Uh, 
If, if you look across the aisle, truly, are we that different? Not we. Are, are you and they, are they that different? I mean, does Mitch McConnell and you at some level fundamentally agree is just how you get to that place that you disagree? Or are there major, like, philosophical differences across the aisle? I think there are major philo philosophical differences because for, for one thing, they wanted to eliminate the Affordable Care Act. They came within one vote of totally eliminating health care coverage for 20 million plus people in our country. They were all pre they were prepared to do that, except for three people, Susan Collins, uh, Lisa Murkowski, and John McCain. Were it not for those three, you would not have the kind of health care coverage that you currently have. They had no problems doing that, or they had no problems voting out the $1.5 trillion in tax cuts to the richest 1% of the people in our country with absolutely no input from the Democrats. So there are major differences in how we view, Democrats view government as, a, as an entity that is supposed to provide not all the answers, but some of the answers that actually enable people to, to uh, have jobs, to have education, to have the kind of opportunities that we all seek. We believe that. They apparently don't. It's pretty awesome. If you talk to them just as individuals, um, you might get a different, uh, I don't know, because I have never been able to ask my Republican colleagues who voted to eliminate health care for millions of people like that. Why did you do that? Why, I mean, how do you vote like that? I assume that they were perfectly aware of what the impact was because we certainly had enough speeches, et cetera, but they did it anyway. I think it must be a very different view on what government is for. We do not view government as the enemy. We view government as part of the solution. Okay. Um, I have to ask you this because I am just so curious. It's just like such a great opportunity. So, uh, you, you know, sometimes I, I bet you agree. You see some of these politicians say something that is so stupid. <laughs> I mean, the earth is flat kind of stupid. And, and, you know, they say that, well, um, the Cohen hearing is a total waste of time, but when I ran the Benghazi hearing for 11 hours, that was a useful, way, you know, use of time. And there, there's, I see such hypocrisy and such irony and such stupidity. And I just want to know, do they understand that they're being hypocritical and stupid, or they are so stupid they don't even see it? So just... Can you give me some insight when somebody says something so hypocritical? Do they know it's hypocritical or they really, they just don't even know? They don't care. So the, whether they know or they don't know, um, you know, the, you have to judge people, not just by what they say, because words do matter, but their actions. And when you want to eliminate health care for 20, 30, 30 million people just like that, that shows me that you really don't care that there are going to be all these millions of people. You don't care. So uh, th th that's awesome, but there you have it. And yeah, there are a lot of really silly things that a lot of people say. But what's really crazy, I think, is that uh, they accuse us of, for example, the president uh, has, has been making fun of those of us who support the Green New Deal, which is really a recognition that the science of global warming is right there. And people who live in Hawaii and Florida and Louisiana and and California, we know the global warming. What's really crazy is to simply deny it, stick your head in the sand. That's the radical thing. Uh, and I think the ra they take really radical positions, and yet you know, they're constantly holding us to some kind of a, a, a standard. And I say, oh, uh, really? <laughs> you know, when they go low, we fight back. That's All what right. we have to do. So um, <laughs> I think you're fundamentally an optimist. So yeah. is the path to a better system of governance, is it seeking common ground, moderation, compromise, or is it stand your ground, you know, is it combative, which is it? Which, there you know, Barack Obama says, you know, don't cave, right? And there are times when you have to stand your ground and you have to know when those times are. So when it comes to uh, healthcare for our people, I believe you have to stand your ground. That's a pretty fundamental priority. Uh, there are plenty of other areas where we have compromised. For example, you know, I sit on the Armed Services Committee, and we always, every year, in a bipartisan way, put out the National Defense Authorization Act, which is, it sets the stage for uh, military activities in our country. That's 
that is uh, uh, bipartisan. And before the shutdown, we managed to pass in a compromise, uh, in a bipartisan way, most of the bills that funds government. That is why the shutdown was a partial shutdown, not fully. So we compromise on a lot of things, but of course what gets focused on is always those areas of contention. And those are big areas, such as the huge tax cuts. The tax cuts that did not uh, help the middle class families and where people may have gotten a little bit of increase in their, in their salaries, but they didn't even notice it. Um, meanwhile, the huge corporations, uh, they have seen the results of the $1.5 trillion in, in tax breaks for themselves, and they certainly didn't use that money to increase worker wages. That's not what happened. Or to create jobs, that's not what happened. And so those are battles that we have to, we have to fight. Okay. And you have to know the difference. There are times when you have to stand your ground. So I'm, not, I'm all for compromise when that makes sense and you're still getting to uh, the goal that you need to get to. Uh, if this national emergency thing happens, uh, is it conceivable that for the next president, the next party, the next administration, did we just cross the Rubicon and now take the Take, a, take maybe a dream case or worst case. So Democrats win in 2020. A Democratic president declares climate change a national emergency. Is that conceivable? And, and the Democratic president says, well, Trump did it. I can do it. It's a national emergency. What's the problem? Even Republicans have a concern that uh, if this president's declaration of national emergency when he himself said, well, I don't really have to do this now. That ain't much of an emergency. Even they, the Republicans, have concerns that uh, the next president could take it much, much further. But there are always uh, the core challenges, and this is why this particular challenge, which the state of Hawaii and California, I believe, are, are among the states that challenge the president's declaration of a national emergency, that's going to go to the Supreme Court, where you already have two people, the two most recent Supreme Court nominees, uh, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, who believe in a very expansive, powerful executive. That's one of the reasons that uh, they're, um, they're on the Supreme Court because they held these kinds of perspectives. So there are two things about Donald Trump that if we remember these two things, you can pretty much uh, provide the motive for anything that he does. One is he needs to protect himself. As we say in Hawaii, he needs to protect his okole. And the second thing is money. So if you, know the, if you understand these two things for Trump, you can provide a lot of motives for what he does in any given situation. Well, doesn't he have a hotel right on the water? I mean. Is that hotel going to be underwater? He still is a climate change denier. Yes, yes. that's what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. So consistency, and I mean, they, don't, they, they really don't pay much attention to science. OK. Uh, could you explain how the PAC system works? I mean, how is it that the NRA, for example, has such swagger? No, because we have dark money, thanks to the Roberts Court decision, mainly in Citizens United, which opened the floodgates for all kinds of what we call dark money that's totally not disclosed. And so one of the bills that just passed the House will provide all kinds of campaign and financing and ethical reforms where at, the, at least this kind of money uh, as to who's providing the money has got to be disclosed. That's the only avenue that the Supreme Court left for Congress to do after uh, Citizens United, where they said there's a constitutional right to be able to provide this kind of money. And so they said, well, the Congress can still act to have this uh, who's providing the money disclosed. And we did that on the House side when I was there, but that got stalled in the Senate. So now the House has passed a bill that is an entire array of various kinds of campaign spending and ethical behaviors, uh, requirements. But, but uh, Mitch McConnell has already said, that bill is not coming to the floor. I'm not letting it come to the floor. And when he was asked why, he said, because I can do it like that. Is he more powerful than Trump? He could be if he acted like the, the Senate is a separate branch of government, but he's, you know, he single-handedly um, made sure that Merrick Garland, who was a much more of a, I would say, uh, he was a person who would have set aside whatever. I don't even know what his, his ideological perspective is, but I, I do know that he is a fair judge. Um, so he's off the court, and meanwhile we have, we have uh, Kavanaugh. Oh. 
uh, staying on the subject of PACs for a second. So I think the NRA gave $3 million to Rubio, right? Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, maybe a GoFundMe campaign, why couldn't that raise like $9 million and rent three more senators and, you know, get the majority? I mean, well, sounds very, you know, sort of <laughs> sneaky, but I mean, do you, I isn't that conceivable that, you know, you rent the senator and, you know, you get the majority and no? Can't the good guys rent the senators every once in a while? It doesn't, co you know, to rent a senator as a senator, uh, I certainly am not rented. By the way, I have a, <laughs> like a triple F from the NRA. So uh, really that's, I would say that most of the people that I know, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, they will tell you that they are there to make a positive difference, but it's in their, how they vote. Uh, that matters as far, that's a huge part of uh, what their priorities actually are. What I would like to see is campaign spending reform that discloses the kind of uh, dark money that is being spent. I would love to have campaign spending limits, but the Supreme Court has already decided, thanks to Chief Justice Roberts and the, the, that court decision in Citizens United, that we can no longer have uh, limits. But part of uh, what this bill will do will pro provide for public financing of campaigns. And you know, let's face it, with the advent of social media, uh, candidates do have an opportunity to raise a lot of money from small donors, and I think that is a, a, a trend that should continue. Uh, speaking of social media, so <sighs> who, who and what do we believe when we read the news now? You know, there's obviously Fox and Breitbart. One could make the case the New York Times is as biased as, you know, in Washington Post. So how do you, how, what's your advice to us, like, to get the truth to the extent we can? What do we read? Who do we believe? When you have a president who, who practically on day one starts to attack the press and calls it fake news, uh, th that is setting the stage for uh, people not believing whatever is reported. And so I do view the Washington Post and New York Times as the legitimate news sources. I do not, uh, I, I have serious questions about Fox News because if you see the kind of inner uh, connection there is, you know, there, I think the New York Times recently wrote an article that uh, Fox News is like the state, uh, it's like the state news. And that's very dangerous because freedom of the press is, uh, is one of the, uh, major freedoms, and if we can't rely on reporting, and this is why Time Magazine in the most recent, I mean, they, they said the press, the press and the, the shining the light on the separation of children at the border, the shining the light on so many things that, that is going on in this country that the press uh, is, are, they are writ large the, the heroes of the, of the day. And thank goodness for that. And so we also need an electorate that doesn't believe everything that, that uh, comes out of these news sources that are very much uh, obviously totally biased toward the president. You know, I think we all know when somebody's not telling the truth. When the president says that I had the biggest crowd for my inauguration in the history of the world, I think we know that's not true because, you know, our lying eyes, we saw that. So I think that we also need to make sure that our education system is such that children do understand that, that uh, there are such things as facts. <laughs> I hope. Yeah, well, it's up to us to create that kind of uh, ability for our kids, uh, analytical ability okay. in our kids. So now, as we're going to 2020, um, I'm going to try to put you on the spot, but can you just tell me, so, candidacy of Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. part of the problem or part of the solution? Does he fragment the Democratic Party or does he bring it together? So, solution or problem? I think that's too easy to ask those kinds of black and white questions. You know, the, the fact of the matter is that on the Democratic side, we have, I would say, an abundance of riches with all the people who are running with all their views. And I think that's really healthy. And we shall see who can stay the course, who can show us that they speak to our 
our hearts, not in a manipulative way, not, not, not playing to our fears, our resentments, or our uh, fear of the other, uh, but to speak to the hearts, to our hearts, to our, literally to our better angels, and a person who can beat Trump. That's what this entire election process, I think, is going to reveal. Okay, so how about candidacy of Howard Schultz as an independent? Does he take away Democratic votes <laughs> and, and re-elect Trump? I say that if he wants to run, he should run as a Democrat. If he has uh, ideas that are worthwhile, he should. You know, he's been a Democrat, why not run as a Democrat? So, you know, with everything that's going on with, uh, with Donald Trump, we know that these are not normal times, that, that uh, all of the institutional checks and balances that we've had, and, and they, they, uh, uh, he pushes the limits of, of constitutional power, and there are all kinds of questions relating to his ethics and conflict of interest, criminality even. Um, uh, those are, those all need to be on the table in this election. But I also know that uh, our candidates can't just be, as we, you know, the, the, the usual uh, perspective is that they can't just be against Trump. We have to really talk about the things that we care about as Democrats. And also, all, believe me, all of the candidates, the Democratic candidates, all my Senate friends who are running, they, are, they all have the kind of priorities that we care about. Healthcare is a right, not a privilege educational opportunities that's affordable, um, institutional reforms, campaign spending reforms. You know, these are infrastructure. These are things that they all support. They may have different ways of getting there. So, so do you think a successful candidate stands for something or stands against something? I think the successful candidate, in my view, stands up to Trump and stands for something. Not just get Trump. Well, that would be our goal. <laughs> Because we can't continue with this, this uh, um, runaway president and administration. And by the way, it's not just him. You should see all of the people who are running the, the uh, departments, all the secretaries. They, they, we, we just got through uh, with the secretary of uh, confirming the secretary of the, uh, the, the, the head of the EPA, and he has spent most of his time undoing all of the regulatory protections that protect our clean air, clean water. So the, the, so many of his, and not to mention so many of them had to resign in disgrace for ethical problems, but so many of the people who are running this administration uh, have positions that are antithetical, contrary to the very departments that they're supposed to be running. That's kind of par for the course for this administration. And, 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 okay, let's take this APA as an example. Like, what goes through their mind? I mean, are they saying that Profits are more important, jobs are more important, or you're really not going to die because of those chemicals in the water. That's fake news. I mean, what, how do they justify that? I think they have a view that government should just stay out of everything possible, including basic health, safety, and welfare protections for our people. So you want to eliminate government as much as possible. You want to constrain government. You want to, you want to not fund government operations that provide the kind of support that our communities and families need. But if, if governments are supposed to stay out of people's business, except for women's bodies. Yes, that's one. That's big. basically the, that's one. the algorithm. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense. But they also like government to provide huge tax breaks to the rich people, though. They like that. Okay. So consistency uh, and hypocrisy are two words that doesn't even factor into the equation with them, sad to say. Okay. That's from, you know, these are the really major kinds of issues that uh, children's health care, uh, health care for all of us, are uh, major issues. Uh, they are not on the same priority page as Democrats are. There's a huge difference. I mean, people tell me, oh, all of you guys are all the same. Oh, really? See, we're not paying attention if that's your conclusion. And that means that we, uh, we have not done a, uh, an effective enough job to point out the differences and the dangers in uh, this presidency and the perspective that government is our enemy and, and the solution is to cut government programs as much as possible, which, by the way, I think that there are people in this audience who depend on Medicare and Social Security. Those two programs are going to be cut to pay for, uh, it's, they would like to, the Republicans would like to, cut these programs to pay for the $1.5 trillion in tax cuts. So these are huge, massive programs that our communities 
rely on, and those are going to be, uh, they would like to make changes that would make it much, much harder for people to get the benefits. Okay. Now, uh, we'll open up for questions from the audience. You go to Slido, they're going to put up a slide about going to Slido and how you ask these questions. Uh, but as you do that, I'd like to know, so we kind of have our minds around the problem, I think. So what do we do? And I mean, we, you know, not a senator, just regular people. What do we do? And don't tell me vote, because assume we're going to vote. No, so I don't assume What else that. can we do? I don't assume that. So people, in, there were 80,000 votes in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania that uh, determined the uh, electoral college votes. 80,000 votes, that's it. Hillary Clinton won by 3 million uh, popular votes. So obviously not everybody who uh, should vote didn't vote. And one of the reasons is voter suppression is going on even as we speak. After a Supreme Court decision called Shelby County, um, it led to some 13 states immediate because that, that decision had to do with eviscerating one of the major protections under the Voting Rights Act. And so 13 states immediately began to pass voter suppression laws because they no longer were under the thumb of Department of Justice review. So when we talk about, you've all heard about uh, voter ID requirements. Well, one of the things that happens is that, you know what, they, the, these, re, these voter ID laws are so precise in its impact that uh, the questions are asked such as, what are the kinds of IDs that college students usually have? What are the kind of IDs that black people usually have? And let us make sure that the voter ID we require will not be those IDs. That is how precisely targeted these voter suppression laws are. And they're not easy to undo, by the way, but these are being passed all the time. And voter suppression works a lot better than encourage people to go out to vote, by the way. So voter suppression is going on all across the country, closing polling places, limiting the days of voting, making it harder to register to vote. All of this is, has the impact of suppressing voters. And by the way, most recently, thank goodness, there was a court that said to Wilbur Ross, our Commerce, I think he's our Commerce Secretary, it's kind of hard to keep track of all, all of them, but he wanted to put the, on the census a question about citizenship. And there was no legitimate purpose for this. I think he, they argued that it's for, uh, to protect voting or something like that, and the, and the court said, no, that is not the purpose of this. It, it is to, to be a chilling effect on communities with a lot of immigrants, and they will not participate, and so there will be massive undercounting of census, which is one of the ways that we decide the resources that go to our community programs. Okay. Vote. So you have to vote. And, <laughs> what you know, else? And these days, everybody can raise their voices because one of the things that's happened as a reaction to, to Trump, in my view, is uh, that women in our country are highly engaged and motivated. And a lot of women are very angry, especially after watching the Kavanaugh hearings and realizing that each one of us probably went through in our lives sexual ha harassment, uh, and I hope not assault, but we've all had to be put up with this BS since I, what I call time immemorial. And, it, and, and we all recognize that we have to lend our voices. This is why so many new people, in my view, it is a mobilized women who elected so many people, so the result was that the Democrats took control over the House. So women's vote are also going to be suppressed. Watch for it. There will be all kinds of ways to attack women and um, uh, make women feel as though we don't have anything to gain by voting. So that's going to start happening. How, how, how would you attack a woman and restrict her ability to vote? You make them feel as though what they're doing is a, a, like uh, one way is that you deny them access to birth control or you deny them the access to someone who will provide abortion, make basic control over our bodies. You do all kinds of things to, to create an environment where you just kind of say, well, what can I do? So there, there are all kinds of ways to suppress uh, voting and it's going on in, in very precise ways all across the country. I, I find that unfathomable, but well, I mean, I'm just a naive, I guess. So read a book by uh, someone named Carol Anderson who uh, wrote about voter suppression in our country. Okay, so beyond voting, uh, 
do you know a million women marching on Washington D.C. Does that move the needle? Does that have an effect? If they stay engaged, and uh, if um, if you know, it's one thing to register to vote, but it's a whole other thing to actually show up. And how are you going to show up to vote if your your uh, uh, voting places are the hours are constrained? or they close voting places, polling places, so there are long, long lines. These are the kinds of tactics that are being used uh, all across the country. And so it, there are all kinds of ways to make it really tough for, for people to vote. And so we have to fight all of that. And there, are, uh, there, there are ways that we can all c come together. And I, I really rely so much on the mobilized women in our country who are very engaged. They need to uh, stay angry, not in a, but in a very focused way. Because if we really care about the things that I talked about, the priorities that we care about, uh, you're, you're not going to get those priorities addressed uh, with, this, uh, uh, with this president or with this Senate. Okay. So we have some good questions here. So one question oh. that scrolled off already was, uh, this person is a Republican uh -huh. and wants to know what he or she can do to get back the Republican Party, really, right? I mean, I think that's the underlying. So what, what, what would a, a Republican do? Well, there was a time when the Republican Party was the country party that stood for fiscal conservative, and, and yet we now that's out the window because of 1.5 trillion in tax cuts that were not, was not paid for. And you know, there are a lot of Republicans who believe that they no longer, uh, this is not their party anymore, it's the Trump party. And so I think that there, there are um, lots of ways that people who share those kind of views can come together, but you notice that the Republicans in the Senate, the ones who spoke out are generally the ones who are retiring. So there, there's a lot of building to be done for the Republican Party. I think that a two-party system is very important. So uh, <laughs> I would say one of the ways is to, uh, to revitalize the Republican Party to the, the, the kind of uh, uh, philosophy that uh, it was identified with, which it no longer is identified okay. with. Okay. Um, look at this second question. Oh my God. Um, I'll read this question verbatim. The US often invades countries Oops, where it considers democracy has failed. Should we, Europe, invade the US and reestablish democracy? <laughs> OMG. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, anonymous. <laughs> That's Pierre or Monique. Um, I do think that uh, the, our allies, for example, who the president doesn't say particularly nice things to, probably are, are wondering what's happening in our country. Uh, what this does is probably to, to encourage our allies to shore up their ability to, uh, to come together and, and uh, uh, defend democracy in their, their countries because I'm sure they're scratching their heads as to what's happening in our country. Yeah. You know, I mean, isn't the United States the largest oil exporting nation in the world? I think it's becoming so. Something yes. like that, right? So you could make the case in order to preserve a supply of oil, you need to invade the United States to bring <laughs> stability to it. Huh. Well. Where have we heard that before? That never went wrong before. Um, Second, this question here, what's your view on Brexit? Does it reflect the global trend of populism? It's more like a global trend of nationalism. So uh, I don't have the answer to that. I, I mean, implementing Brexit is its own set of challenges. It's not that easy to just leave the European Union. So Europe is going to have to contend with that. Believe me, we have our own issues that we better <laughs> kind of address, like starting with the President of the United States. Okay. Uh, what steps can the DNC take to reestablish and unify its image? Will saying at least we're not Trump be enough in 2020? <laughs> no, as I said, we need to stand up to Trump and stand for. Uh, things like uh, health care as a right, not a privilege, education uh, that is affordable and available. Uh, there's... Uh, uh, <laughs> Clearly, we need to protect Social Security and Medicare uh, from the kind of dramatic cuts that, that Trump and his ilk want to impose. Uh, that also includes Medicaid, because the Trump plan already cuts from 1.5 trillion in Medicaid, and we know a lot of families rely on 
Medicaid. So, so we need to make clear, people need to kind of get that we're on their side and we will fight for you. Okay, second question is, oh man, there's some good questions here. You guys should be moderators there. So uh, Cohen told Republicans he was once in their shoes and that following Trump led him to where he is. Do you see any Republicans taking this warning seriously? I think what he was saying is to support this line, President, uh, is uh, the history will nudge judge uh, the people who blindly follow Trump because of the fear of their own re-elections. Re so uh, it's not that they're all going to go to prison unless they conspired or did those things. But I think uh, the warning is that this is a president that should not be followed because of all, all of the uh, kinds of uh, allegations against him, which probably will be um, su su sustainable. So I think the, the message is we've we got to start asking. The Republicans need to ask these questions. But right now, they're really not, because uh, the reality apparently is that they're very afraid that Trump will go after them. And he still has a. Uh, uh, support in places where Republicans run from. Okay. Uh, I love this question. Can you imagine people being able to vote online? What are the challenges there? That would make it easier to vote. I think that as long as we can make sure that the online voting is not subject to hacking, and as we all know, it's all too easy to hack into our systems because the Russians did it with uh, uh, the the... the systems of many states. They couldn't change the outcomes, but they, they, um, it's not that hard, apparently, to hack into our systems. That was the entire process of interfering with our 2016 elections. I think we should make voting as easy and but at the same time secure as possible. No, in, in Australia, I think, anybody here from Australia? Voting is mandatory, right? Yes. You get penalized if yes. you don't vote, right? <laughs> Why couldn't we do that? Why, I mean, what's I suppose I still believe that uh, in a democracy like ours that, that uh, uh, we, should, we all recognize how important it is to exercise that hard-won right to vote and that, that it should not be something that is forced upon us. If we have a, a country where we only do things that we ought to be doing as citizens only if we are penalized or get paid, that's really not the road I'd like to go down. Howard Schultz could do something positive, like, you know, if you prove that you vote, you get a free cappuccino or something. I mean, Well, that I could go that for. Would be, <laughs> that would be something he could do. Um, <laughs> as one of the only Asian-American women in Congress, what are the best ways for women in POC? What is POC, Steph? Right? People of color. Oh, people of color. <laughs> Jeez, and I'm Asian. Um, <laughs> are you, I didn't know that. Oh, oh yes. Well, for the longest time, I was, I mean, first, I, I'm the first Asian woman to ever be elected to the United States Senate. And for, <laughs> I'm also the only immigrant to serve in the United States Senate, so immigration reform is very purposeful work for me. And I came as a very poor immigrant with a single mother who uh, worked really hard. We have very little money, so I know what it's like, paycheck to paycheck, all of that. So I'm the only first immigrant uh, to serve. Um, and. Frankly, you know what? Um, the fact that we have such a diverse group of people in the U.S. House gives me hope. Um, as I said, for the first four years, I was the only Asian woman, but now I'm joined by Kamala Harris, by uh, um, um, Tammy Duckworth, Duckworth yeah. who went to McKinley High School. And on this, and the Judiciary Committee, uh, I sit right here, Cory Booker is right here, Kamala Harris is right here. Kamala refers to us as the POCs on that committee. <laughs> and somebody tweeted, like, do they make them all sit together like that? <laughs> no, it's because of seniority. Are they segregating you? No, it, it just so happens that Kamala was the last person to get on that committee, so she's there. But the three of us, often we commiserate and we, we can communicate non-verbally also. But I'm really glad that we are there. And often we will vote to, together on, on, some, on some of the nominees. So it's good to have those two because uh, before that, I was it <laughs> on that committee did they, on like, our side. Did they ask you to go get them coffee or Of course anything? not. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, uh, as you, some of you may know, if you watch MSNBC or CNN, I do quite a lot there. I used to go on Fox News, but um, they take their wax on me all, quite often. But um, I speak very plainly. Uh, one, of my, uh, one of my journeys has been 
to be able to speak what I call very plainly, uh, which is my way to be myself and to, to just speak in a way that a lot of people will just come up to me wherever I am to say thank you for speaking the way you do. It's not that easy for, for politicians, I'm sorry to say, to be able to expose ourselves in a way that people feel like they can relate to us. And so that means that sometimes I swear, you know, and I say, with everything that's going on, if you're not moved to swear once in a while, you are not paying attention. <laughs> yeah. So every once in a while, I'll say things, and um, that's, and it's oh. not as though my people script, they don't say this is where you should, you should say bullshit now. It just comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle Obama said that, right? Um, uh, well, see, so if the words fit. That's good company. That's good company. Yeah. Uh, these, are, these are really tough times, and I do not make light of it. But one thing is, one thing I learned is that one person can make a difference because my mother changed my life by bringing me to this country. I was brought up by my grandparents on a rice farm with no running water. It was very rural. Uh, of course, I spoke not a word of English when I came here, but one person can make a difference, and in my life, you know, she changed my, li my life. So I would say, to, especially to young people, there are three life lessons that I've learned over time. One is one person can make a difference, so each of us can make a difference. And if you're, if, you know, if you're behaving in sort of your normal way, these are not normal times, please do something that makes you go this way, expand what you're doing. The second is half the battle is showing up. So I'm glad that you showed up today. It's not just showing up physically, but it's showing up to state a course for what's meaningful to you. And the third is to take some risks. We can't just stay in our own narrow lane of, 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 of uh, behavior that is comfortable. You have to get uncomfortable sometimes. And that is how uh, we grow. You think that guy, you think that me, the Kamiki High School local girl, do you think I kind of emerged like this? No. No way. No. Uh uh. Because I come from a society that is not particularly confrontational or, or verbal. And I'm not knocking Hawaii because I'm grateful to represent a state that is so, um, so supportive of diversity and all that, but it took me quite the journey to, to speak out the way I do. And, and I think it's really important in these times for people to see a minority face like mine, an Asian, and, and to be able to uh, uh, basically uh, stand up to the president as a, a, lot of us, a lot of us do. So, you know, I, I'm at the point where I am myself and it was a big journey to be myself and to speak plainly. So I'm glad to be where I am now. It, it was a long time coming. There you Thank go. you. All right. Anyone so, <laughs> Maisie or Senator, it's truly been a pleasure and an Thank honor. You. Um, <laughs> You know, we're both from Hawaii, so we share a common heritage. Yes, and, uh, I knew his dad quite well. His dad was a state senator. Oh, my dad. Duke. My dad was, was an ass kicker, too. I mean. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so you um, come from good stock. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much. And thank you had to fly all the way from D.C. for this and, and, and take all this time and effort. And I think the work that you're doing is so important. And I hope that you know all of you will show up and yeah. keep showing show up. up keep resisting Do thank more. you very much thank you thank you very much <laughs> thank you